Welcome to Beans and Breakdowns, a podcast dedicated to bridging the gap between specialty coffee and the heavy music community. On this episode, I'm joined by Evan Wood, coffee director of Night Swim Coffee in Charlotte, North Carolina. So grab a fresh cup of coffee and wake the fuck up! What's going on, Caffeinated Crew? Today, I am joined by a dear friend of mine, uh, a longtime friend, Evan Wood. He is director of coffee for Night Swim Coffee in Charlotte. Evan, how are you doing this morning? So good, man. Thrilled to be here. And uh, we were just talking briefly. It's been like, I don't know, eight years since we talked last. <laughs> uh, and we used to spend all the time in the world together. So uh, it's cool to, to reunite for sure. So this is what it's like. You just, it's it's like day and night for a year and then no hanging out for eight years. So after today, I think it'll be another year before we talk again. For sure. You got to meet the quota and then we just set it on the the side table. The exponential passage of time. (laughs) Um, Well, I am so delighted to be seeing your beautiful face on my screen today. Um, I'm always happy to catch up with friends and especially friends that are doing things that are really, really, really cool in the coffee and music industry. So I'm so excited to talk to you. <laughs> it's going to be awesome, dude. Yes. Uh, starting things off, what are you drinking? Man, uh, so I've got a, a community lot uh, from up in the Agaro Forest in Ethiopia. It's one of the highest, or probably the highest growing region in the world um, from a cooperative um, called uh, Gogogu uh, Bakaka. This is a lot from like that washing station. Um, it's on our uh, coffee menu. Uh, it's super tasty. It's like a pretty typical like washed Ethiopian, um, really like peach tea um, and floral, but there's this super interesting thing. And this is what stood out on the, on the cupping table for us was like, it has this like cucumber thing, you know, when you eat like basil or cucumber has this like cooling effect in your Mm -hmm. mouth. This coffee does that. Um, and it's super wild. So I had never really experienced that. So we, we chose it. Um, but yeah, go, go, go Bakaka. Number one is what I'm sipping on. What about you? That sounds really, really good. Um, I have a coffee from traffic roasters. It's a amazing roaster here in Montreal. Uh, it is called Dago uh, Bulehora. It's from the uh, Dago village in, in Bulehora, Ethiopia. I don't know a ton about the um, the co-op or, or the village, but it is a um, just a local variety. Natural. I love natural Ethiopian coffees because I get all of the fruity flavors like oh, yeah. blood orange. Yeah. Blueberry, of course. Oh, yeah. um, the traffic always puts like weird tasting notes on their bag, which is funny. Uh-huh. So they yeah. put seven up. I don't taste. <laughs> no. First of all, I don't drink seven up. <laughs> I'm not uh, really sure what that would taste like in the first place, but, but I'm guessing it's like lemon lime. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Lemon lime would be, but yeah. I definitely get a lot of that blood orange. Um, that's awesome. So it's really, really delightful. I think, uh, especially in coffee, you get so much acidity from, you know, Ethiopian African mm-hmm. coffees a, a lot of the time. And so getting a hit of like a sweet orange citrus Mm-hmm. in there is amazing that's why yeah. i love espresso tonics because you just oh, squeeze true. some of that orange up in there yeah you get the best of both worlds so well cheers yeah cheers to you dude we're doing it we're out here A- happy morning <laughs> but yeah i love their branding though it's so nice like oh that's super dope I need and their to write bags this down. Are, their bags are weird right yeah their bags look like um uh what's that guy um he won the U.S. Barista Championship, or no, the World Barista Championship in like 2014. Hold on. Uh, Gardelli? He's oh, in Italy. Oh. Yeah, I just, I had a bag of Gardelli. Uh, there's a shop here that sells it. Oh, really? Yeah, and and um, Justin from Bolt Coffee, uh-huh. he's not there any longer, but um, I was drinking it on his episode. I had an insane, it was a 48-hour anaerobic um, mm-hmm. El Salvador. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Gard- Gardelli does some, well, they buy some really expensive coffees. Um, but that package, those bags are pretty sure are the same exact ones that they use. Yeah. It's like um, this weird long zipper thing. Yeah. I it's like really that. cool. I like it. It's a different keeps, shape. Keeps that coffee fresh too. Um, Absolutely. well, awesome. Uh, 
speaking more about coffee, you've already kind of graced us with like a slew of, of, of words, <laughs> of words, of <laughs> knowledge. Yeah. Uh, your introduction to specialty coffee. I know you've been into, I think, very similar to me finding counterculture and kind of delving in, in the Charleston area, but kind of walk us through yeah. what, what your introduction was. So my, my introduction is, uh, very unexpected, uh, like relative to the position that I'm in currently <laughs> in my specialty coffee career. Um, so I found out about specialty coffee from my mom, actually. Uh, she kept, she was like shopping at whole foods or whatever in like 20, I don't know. 2012 probably 2011 um and she kept bringing home bags of perk coffee shout out nice. perk and savannah shout out perk for um real. and i like never thought twice about it and i wasn't a coffee drinker really i guess i was like in like a if all the adults were drinking coffee then i'd be like oh i want some of that um <laughs> and so anyways i picked up a perk bag one day and i just started like reading stuff on it and i was like this sounds like way different than like conceptually what I think about what coffee is. And I like went to their website and they like had all these like brewing guides and like info about the coffee. And I was like, hold up. This is not what I thought it was going to be. Um, and then that was like the end of it, dude. I just started diving down the rabbit hole. Um, and I started, you know, I got like a little Melita cone pour over thing and I would get a tea kettle without a spout and like dump water into the Melita cone with some pre ground perk coffee. And I was like, dude, I'm living the specialty coffee dream right now. I had no idea. Uh, and, and yeah, so that's where I started and, I ended up eventually getting a job at a coffee roaster in um, Somerville, South Carolina. Um, Not going to shout them out because uh, they don't need a shout out. Uh, It was an interesting experience uh, and and we moved on and we learned from it. Uh, And and that was like a very second wavy sort of situation that was like... Couldn't be excited about the coffees with customers. And Mm -hmm. so I like... I was like, man, I want to go somewhere where I can like have this dialogue with folks. Cause right now I, like, I'm, I'm not proud to showcase these coffees cause they're not good, you know? <laughs> um, so I ended up getting hired at collective coffee in Charleston. Mm-hmm. And that was like w- what took the like intellectual stimulant of specialty coffee and like made it, uh, a real thing with real people where like, uh, the standard of like, excellence and service and like taking coffee to like a very um intentional service experience was like what ignited the flame and i was like oh i want to do this forever now um Mm -hmm. and that shop at that time was like i mean it had to be one of the best shops in the nation like it was just absolutely murdering um some of the greatest folks that i've ever met in coffee worked there um and are still like doing huge things in the coffee community today like i think about that initial staff and like uh most of those folks still work in coffee and are like all over the place doing really cool things. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was definitely like a perfect place in the space time continuum that I ended up there uh, and, uh, benefited a lot from those folks for sure. Yeah. Shouts out collective coffee. When I was living in Charleston, that was like my shop because I lived in Mount Pleasant. Yeah. So that was the spot, dude. It was so good. You know, introduced to coffee, uh, what was the, the coffee that changed, you know, your life, your oh, perspective yeah. on coffee? Do you remember that cup? I got two, two cups, um, in different places and different times. Uh, the first cup ever that made me like, I'm going to dedicate my life to this. Uh, I was in Brooklyn. Emily took me to Devotion. Oh yes. And I bought a $15 pour over of a geisha. Um, it was like, I don't know, like a bronze tip geisha. I don't, I, I wish I was cognizant enough back then to like, you know, no details about it, but, um, I had no idea what I was doing. I just saw like big price probably means big good. Right. Uh, and so they delivered the coffee and it was on a V60 and mm-hmm. I took the first sip of it and I like my head exploded. Like it was just the most anti coffee flavored thing I'd ever had. Like, I mean, sure there was some coffee there, but it was like, so tea, like so much like Jasmine and citrus and mm-hmm. florality and like all this stuff. And I was like, what is this? Um, and that was like mind blowing. And then 
every pour over ever after that has just been like, can I get a cup as good as that one? Yeah. Um, and which is really disappointing as well. Cause like, it's probably like a geisha that's a hundred dollars a pound to buy green and yeah. people just don't have the resources to put their hands on that. A lot of cases. Um, and then my second, like more sustainable, normal experience, uh, was I think three years in a row when Idito came out fresh crop, um, that coffee was like, I mean, it's still one of my favorite coffees in the world. It still hits hard, but like from like 2015 to 2017, Idito was just like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Uh, For those of you who don't know, it's a washed uh, Ethiopian offering from counterculture um, that I think kind of set the bar for like what back then, at least like what people expected from washed Ethiopian coffees. Um, Yeah. Still so many memories around that coffee at collective. We would brew it as like, a flash iced coffee during the oh. summer and it just tasted like lemonade. Like it was so insane. What a great it's, experience. I know exactly what you mean about the Adido because when I was working at, um, city coffee that became blue door, um, we were a counterculture shop. So yeah. when we got the Adido, like it was so weird because I was still kind of learning how to taste, but we put it on espresso. Oh my God. It was insane. These flavors, what are they? I'm very much on board with like, just like there's coffee and then there's like God tier. And then like for the rest of your life, you're searching for another. So like the place where like the rubber meets the road on this conversation is like, can we create an environment or an industry where like those sorts of like flavor experiences with coffee can like happen not at $9 for a pour over, but at right. $3 and 50 cents. Right. Like that's what we're really after is like, uh, we find so much value in those experiences and like the mass amount of people have never been able to be in the spaces to have those experiences. So like, right. h- how can we, how can we bridge the gap between, you know, a, f- a $4 coffee and a $15 coffee, you know? Um, because there absolutely is coffees uh, that are, are coffees that taste uh, as remarkable as like quality and complex that are way cheaper. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, we should also be able to lob them and be like, Oh my gosh, this coffee was so good. Right. It was only $4. Like that's okay. Right. Um, and, and so that's a, uh, it's been something that we've kind of been after is like, Kim, Kim, well, not can we, but let's decide to source coffees that are more sustainable from a from a from that price point kind mm-hmm. of standard, um, and still deliver that kind of like quality experience that people are are really searching for. Right. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that making coffee accessible, not just for you know high dollar insane coffee people, uh, right. like making that experience a normality, right, is something very important. Part of your your job as director of coffee, I know is, is roasting, but it's also green buying. Yeah. Um, we were talking earlier about some of kind of the, the complexities in <laughs> the global coffee economy, especially right. in the lat am market. Like what are, what are some of these complexities that you're finding yeah. right now buying um, green coffees and, and everything like that? Right. So kind of how, well, for a lot of like small roasters and whatever, um, how green buying works is you kind of choose some like importing partners to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and the approach to how you do that is, is, you know, subject to the person. Um, but <clears throat> basically how we have decided to kind of build those relationships have really been just on like, can we find folks who have similar interests and like similar convictions and partner with them in a way that we can, um, have like year over year relationships with farmers. Cause like the direct trade thing is, is interesting. Um, in a lot of cases, it's just kind of a sham. Uh, and, but there are like lots of instances where, um, you're able to have that like one-on-one relationship with the producer or the, you know, where it gets processed at or whatever. So for instance, mm-hmm. like, and also, uh, those people love to hear about their coffees. Cause a lot of cases, like put yourself in the shoes of a farmer, right? You spend your whole life, like 
developing these coffees and processing them and growing them and like keeping up with harvest and whatever. And then they get shipped away and you never hear about them again. So like for things to come full circle is like very, very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Um, so we just, um, uh, a good friend of ours just started working for a really small importer that only imports Colombian coffees. Um, they're, they're owned and by a a Colombian brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually got to meet them. They're really great. And they brought one of their like farming partners with them to the U S when they came and visited. So we got to meet Felipe. Um, and, uh, we just bought one of Felipe's coffees. Uh, and I got to like message him on Instagram and be like, yo dude, like, I'm so excited to have your coffee. Like, this is so cool. And he was like, Oh my gosh, this is so meaningful. Like, can't (laughs) wait to try it. Uh, whatever. And like, those things are, you can't beat it. Like to see like something, because we often like think about the roaster as like the most important part of this whole value chain. When in reality that it's really flipped and that has Mm -hmm. like walking into this like role and starting this new business has been like, okay, how can we shed a light on where these coffees come from? How can we like narrate them? How can we uh, tell their story and be heralds of these producers who, uh, in a lot of cases, their their name, their hard work, their efforts are completely in the dark for Americans or for whoever's consuming their product. So, right. um, it's a it's an interesting kind of time as well for coffee buying and coffee growing. Um, this year, Brazil got hit with like two really big frosts. Um, and they lost like millions of bags of coffee. And so, uh, it kind of turned the coffee market upside down because right. a lot of like places like Colombia and Mexico had to then like, uh, compensate for Brazil's lack of volume. And it kind of sent the, the price of coffee through the roof. And like, it's been a very tumultuous time for green buyers, for importers, for, for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, because in a lot of cases, like, <clears throat> uh, let's say, a lot of green coffee buying is done in like a forward contract where I I tell you like, Hey, I want, um, you know, 20 bags of, of this coffee of like a flavor profile that's similar to X, Y, and Z. And I want to pay like X amount of money for it. Right. And so my importing partners then go find that coffee. They send us samples and we choose one. That's like how the forward booking process starts. And then you sign a contact contract that like locks in the price. Right. But what's happening though, is like all these farmers, uh, signed contracts with importers or exporters uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago when the price of coffee was nothing. And now the price of coffee is like a bajillion dollars. And these farmers um, are defaulting on their forward contracts because they can sell the coffee for so much more currently. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, like you run into this dilemma where you're like, okay, this farmer has this opportunity to make triple what he normally would. Uh, but he also like made a contractual obligation to do that. And there's this like real big gray area of like what's going on. Um, and I mean, there's a whole slew of things that happen very often and with the specialty market. Um, so for folks who don't know, so there's two kind of different like differentiations for coffee. So coffee from a quality standpoint is graded on a hundred point scale. Uh, anything below 80 points is considered commodity grade. So that's like your grocery store coffee, um, a lot of Starbucks stuff, Dunkin' Donuts. Also, we cupped a bunch of like commodity coffee blind just to let, and we scored it just to see. And Dunkin' Donuts destroyed everybody. So shout out Dunkin' Donuts. Still, <laughs> still amazing coffee. What about uh, Tim's? Did you get any Tim's in there? Oh, uh, we didn't get any Tim's. No, <laughs> I just went to Harris Teeter down the road and grabbed some bags off the shelf. Nice. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure Tim's would be great. So coffee is graded on a hundred point scale. Um, anything over 80 points is considered specialty grade. Mm-hmm. Um, however, while that's like the highest 20, 20 percent percentile of like quality standards, uh, it only, the specialty market only makes up like 20% of the coffee bought on an annual basis. Like the mm-hmm. majority of coffee that's grown in the world is produced for the commodities market. Um, and so there's like these long, long standing farming practices and processing practices and like how, so in most cases in specifically in Latin America, um, people have small farms and they bring their crops to like a communal, um, processing plant essentially. And that's how they like sell their coffees through like right. these 
we call them community lots. Um, and they're basically like blended together with other producing producers in that area and sold as like a particular product. Um, and that is how like the ebb and flow of a, a good portion of coffee growing has happened outside of like the huge monopoly farms, um, for, for a really long time. And right. with the dawn of like the specialty market, we have all of these importers and roasters and coffee companies who like want to pay top dollar for the top coffees, um, which is understandable and, and because there is a market for it. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of interrupting this like typical supply chain rhythm where now these farmers who normally would submit their high quality crop to their, you know, community washing station or whatever it is, um, are now just like circumventing that, selling it direct to importers. Um, and therefore the quality of the community's coffee is falling and they can't charge as much money for it. Right. Um, and then there are these other, other particular farms who are making buku bucks on because they have access to like, you know, either, uh, better technology, um, more advanced or educated processing techniques. Um, and it's, it's just an interesting sort of like, uh, gray area ebb and flow kind of issue is like, how much is, how much money is enough? Uh, how much, um, how much should we care about how these communities function? Because I mean, coffee growing is their like, it's what put foods on food on the table, you know? Yeah. Um, and so there are, are a lot of kind of like hurdles and issues for folks who who are doing this. Thankfully, um, a lot of the green buyers for small roasters and whatever don't have a ton of, um, well, they can work hand in hand with importing partners who do this, you know, day over day, who mm -hmm. are on the ground, who have buying stations in these towns. Um, and so there, I mean, there's a lot of good work being done. It's definitely not like a doom and gloom sort of situation. Um, right. But there, there definitely are like some, you know, both moral and logistical issues that the world is facing right now mm -hmm. um, with especially coffee booming, with the supply chain being very difficult because of like COVID things and like ports being shut down and right. the frost in Brazil. Like it's like this crazy, uh, really wild world, especially for someone like me who is relatively new to the whole green buying escapade. When, you know, when we started getting ready to start purchasing coffees for our menu, talking to importers, they're like, well, this is an interesting time for you to start doing this. Uh, and, and so it's been, uh, rough and interesting and like pricing is like crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you got to take it day by day, I suppose. Well, thank you for spitting some, some knowledge and in, in words about, uh, coffee. I know that, you know, being new to especially green buying. Uh, I commend you for the time of this. Oh, it's so uh, fun, dude. The I timing mean, of this. <laughs> how, how, how this whole thing, well, there's not just like roasting and all sorts of coffee things. It seems like this very mysterious, like ethereal, <laughs> like thing, like, oh my God, like you only learn this from a sensei, you know? <laughs> uh, and there was like, two decent books I could find on green buying and like, right. And so basically what I did is I started reaching out to importers and mm -hmm. I was like, Hey, I, we're doing this thing and I'm kind of new to it. I, I know how the process works, but I don't know the formalities like help. And a lot of our like most solid importer relationships have grown because they responded to that question in like a, Oh my God, like let's hop on a, on a call. I'd love to tell you everything about like, my experience in the industry, yada, yada, yada. And like, and that's how we find out, like there are some really good folks to work with and mm -hmm. who are open books about this whole thing. Um, and not this, like this information is for me and I'm not yeah. going to share it because you're a competitor right. because the coffee world is only going to move forward if we do it together and right. not this like weird competitive gate kept thing. Extremely important. That's what is the, the, uh, the mission of the podcast is mm -hmm. like elitism sucks, gatekeeping sucks, uh, like being transparent and, and inclusive and open-minded to help progress people. That's the only way, like in music and especially right. in, in coffee, like you right. said, like there's room for everybody to learn. There's room for everybody to grow. We should support that if people show and interest. room for everybody to share what they already know. Yes. That's a huge part is like there, there are so many folks who could help so many people, but... 
you just got to take the time to share, you know? Right. Uh, and yeah, collaboration's key. We'll yes. Do Collaboration station. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now that we have flooded people's brains with just yeah. deep coffee sure. nerd out, um, yeah. let's move into some, some music talk. Music. I know that you love, for. I know you love music. I love music. Um, your first heavy music show. What was that experience? Just jumping right into it. Eh? Um, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> first heavy music show. Uh, my brother drove him and I to Atlanta to the masquerade to see, uh, uh, enter Shikari Silverstein, uh, August Burns Red. Oh yeah. A day to remember who else was on that bill. It was such an insane tour. That's uh, insane. Yeah. Uh, and there was another band. I can't remember who they were. Uh, but yeah, that was my first, like, not my first concert experience, but my first, like, heavy show. Uh, and I was in, like, ninth grade, I think. So this was 2008, 2009. Mm. Uh, and... It was wild. Yeah, we drove up and back the same day. And Brian was like 16 or 17, and I was like 15. That's safe. Or I guess he was 18, if that, because he's three years older than me. I can't believe my parents let us do that. But that's crazy. uh, Yeah. It was a great show. That's awesome. At the Masquerade, at the old one, by the the Murder Kroger. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Great story. Wow. Uh, I miss miss the old Masquerade. I always wanted to play there. We yeah. never did. Sad. Uh, what is what is your current playlist? What have I been listening to? Um, well, New Under Oath came out. Yes, it did. So Voyeurist. I've I've, I've listen, listened to that a couple times. Still trying to figure out how I feel about it. Um, I have thoughts as well. Yeah. It. I think sonically is great. Like I. I think it's cool. I'm interested. I know that they produce like quite a few like uh, like documentary segments, kind of talking about how it how the album took shape and like mm-hmm. where it came from. So I'm kind of interested to see the context in, in all of this. Um, it sounds like there was quite a bit of strife inside the band. Um, I mean, but yeah, it, it's fine. It just, it sounds like, I mean, this is the comment that's gone around everywhere. Like even Wendy's roasted under oath for this. I don't know if you saw that tweet, uh, but they just kind of sound like angry high schoolers who just like got permission to cuss, you know, oh, hold on. I'll pull Wendy's up. Wendy said this. Yeah, so on the day that the album dropped, Under Oath tweeted at Wendy's and said, roast us. And, hold on, let me grab my phone. And Wendy's response was hysterical. Um, Under Oath said, roast us. And Wendy said, new stuff sounds like my little brother trying to cuss for the first time. That's amazing. Okay, because Wendy's... kind of accurate. Wendy's has been listening to Under Oath then. Like, because yeah, they feel they about how everyone else does. Yeah. Yeah. So I've listened to that a little bit. Um, it's fine. Um, uh, what else? Obviously turnstiles 2021 release. So good. That's like on repeat. Cannot Um, talk about it enough. It's so good. Uh, silent planets 2021 release is really good. I've been listening to that a lot still. Um, what else have I, I've also been on a, like a really enormous hip hop kick for the last couple of years as well. Um, Drop some names. Drop yeah, them. dude. So my last couple months have solely been uh, Polo G. Okay. Big good. And then I've been on a huge E40 kick, and I don't know why. Wow. E40? I don't know if you listen to E40, but dude, I uh, I love E40. That that style of rap is like so unique, and he's just a crack up. And he also sounds like a cartoon character. He does. Uh, and and I don't know. I just kind of dig it. It's 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 just been scratching my 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 itch here recently uh what was the thing that was big with e40 like i was working at the studio doing a lot of hip-hop and he was kind of featured on everything mm. but yeah it's like e40 like he literally <laughs> yeah. like sounds like a caricature of a rapper yeah. his voice sounds like it's inside of a voice like it's yes it's like i don't know how else to describe it it's <laughs> like, like a men in black style like when the face comes <laughs> off and it's right. e40 inside <laughs> of the head that's, that's what 100 percent right i love that yeah, yeah. that that is i I haven't heard that name in like six years. Dude, you should go put on some E40 this afternoon. It'll, it, dude, it's I might so good. do it. I might clean the house, listen to E40. <laughs> You'll find yourself way more confident in yourself than you were previously. 
That's yeah, great. that's my that's my playlist recently. Mostly turnstile and hip hop. I like that. It's almost yeah. the same. There's a crossover there. Yeah, absolutely. Blow to Orange is on that one track. Uh, oh, yeah. Alien Love Connection. Yep. Um, that whole album is such a banger. Oh man. Yes, can't get enough of it. I won't talk mm. about it anymore. Nancy that's says fine. I talk about it too much. Um, right. uh, we were in Me and the Trinity together. Mm. <clears throat> what long time. time. Long time's passed. Yeah. What is your favorite <laughs> Me and the Trinity memory? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have sat down and th- I didn't on purpose sit down and think about this. I kn- I figured you'd probably ask because I I wanted it to be like a visceral like yeah <laughs> like off the top of my head. Well, there are, I'll say some memories that come to mind. Okay. Uh, here, maybe the top ones. Um, I explicitly remember, I think we were somewhere in Georgia, um, and we, sp- we sprayed a can of Axe on my brother's back in, in the shape of a cross and then lit it on fire uh, outside the venue because we were bored and we got there too early. Uh, that was in that was in Columbus. That was in Columbus, Georgia. Yeah, that was just, that was the scariest show I think we ever played. Like half of the bands were so horrifying. There was, it was like, one the last guy, twelve seconds of life. Oh yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, do you remember the guy who played guitar in the last twelve seconds of life? His entire right arm was just tattooed black, and the only skin you could see was in the shape of a coffin on his hand. As a I, as a tenth grader, that was very scary to me. As a 10th grader who was actively going to church. <laughs> That's very, very, very scary right? for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's a memory. Um, I also remember on the Florida run when we got that really seedy hotel and didn't tell the guy who ran it that all of us were staying in the room. And then he found out the next morning and, like, caused a huge scene. Uh, I remember that. That was a... Interesting memory. That was very uh, interesting. I, I I would say probably my favorite memory is it's both favorite and most horror filled is being in the back of Mike Jones's mom's van <laughs> for, you know, whatever, two weeks. But my brother was the, no, my brother was the navigator and Mike was the driver and Mike broke his glasses so he couldn't see. <laughs> And you know, my brother's like half deaf. So they're like trying to communicate and we couldn't get anywhere because Brian would tell Mike where to go. He wouldn't see it because he didn't have glasses. He would ask my brother again and Brian would be like, what? (laughs) And then next thing you know, we're 30 miles down the road. (laughs) I think that is that those like interactions on that, on that tour were uh, very special. That. Yeah, the, that run changed so many things. Like, you know, when you're a kid and you're a band and you're like, oh, we're going to tour, we're going to tour. Touring is everything. And then you go on tour and you realize like, this is not great. <laughs> like, yeah, I sat on gear. On for, wooden boxes. Yeah, we sat on wood. Like our, like, our heads were literally, like you had to sit like this at yeah. an angle. It was horrible. <sighs> I Mike think my Jones back, lost his wallet before that tour as well. Remember, yeah, he, he didn't have any money or a license or a license, and he drove the whole. He way. drove the whole thing. <laughs> and then Brian was. Why did Brian even tour with us? Oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. The whole there were a lot of big question marks about about that whole that whole endeavor. Uh, I look and, I look back on it with a lot of fondness. Yeah, but I also like. I also go back and listen to music. I think I even texted Timmy one time. And I was like, hey, dude, I think now that I'm 10 years older, I think you had a really great vision for like what you wanted the music to sound like. And we had a really bad vision for what we wanted the music to sound like. And I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I think Timmy like that. Timmy had an idea sonically that was pretty ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. Um, And we I, I know that I wanted to sound like August Burns Red and Brian wanted to be an 80s hair metal band. He he wanted to play like Asking Alexandria. Yeah. And Mike Jones kind of seemed like he was the only one that understood because he was like trying to play like Cancer Bats. Right. Which is very similar. Yeah. 
And I now was just I trying to be a wolf it, from the chariot. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was the expectation that was kind of put on you as well. We were like, can you do this? And but I wasn't like, good at base. I'm going to do this. But like, the I mean, thing is, I wasn't really playing like most of the parts. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but you looked cool while you did it. But everybody also, thought it was cool. Can we talk about this real quick? This still, like, I wake up pretty often thinking about this and get really upset. <laughs> okay. For those of you listening, and if any of you were around looking at you, Nolan, uh, for, <laughs> for, the, for me and the Trinity Days in Savannah, neither Mike Jones or Brian Wood owned a tuner for their guitars for two years. We never tuned guitars. We, they only tuned to each other. So our music got progressively less and less tuned <laughs> and, and lower and lower over the course of two years because they only ever tuned relative to each other. And but Grayson would tune the bass with a tuner. <laughs> <laughs> And so if you wondered, if you ever wondered why it sounded horrible, it's because the guitars were out of tune. The bass was was in tune. (laughs) But it's not like Grayson was playing the bass anyways. So that was the least important part of the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, man. Good times. We we, we can wrap things up. Uh, I just have one last question for you before Mm -hmm. we go. I've really enjoyed catching up with you. Uh, you're like a brother to me that we yeah, shared yeah. a van with. So <laughs> uh, what's your favorite city for beans and breakdowns? Oof. Uh, favorite city for beans and breakdowns. I don't want to be generic. Cause I feel like you could say like Boston or New York and come up with some cafe. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Okay. Here we go. Unconventional here. I'll get flamed for this. Uh, shout out. Bold Bean Coffee, shout out Murray Hill Theater. I'm Fuck going yeah. Jacksonville, Florida That's for right. all the beans and breakdowns. That's right. Jacksonville for life, baby. Let's go, dude. Like that, <laughs> I, I was literally thinking when I asked you, because it was like, oh, I think Atlanta would probably be mine. And then you said oh, Jacksonville. True. I was like, nope, Jacksonville. <laughs> it's Jacksonville. I don't know why. Like, I just have so many positive memories. And they're like, Bold Bean is a really great roaster. If you guys never checked out Bold Bean before, shout out to them. They do a good job. Um, they actually have uh, a coffee that's one. I was actually just looking on their website the other day. Um, they were sharing a coffee offering, which is pretty cool. Um, and I'm like, oh, cool. Which means they probably have some pretty similar, uh, you know, uh, buying convictions and whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it's a good sign. Like Jax is in my heart, in my yeah. heart of hearts. I always felt like we were a Jax band. Yeah. hundred um, percent. So, well, Evan, I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's been so yeah, fun dude. to catch up. Like I wish yeah. I could like reach through the screen and give I you know, a hug. Give you a big but... old hug. <laughs> yeah, dude. Thanks for having me. Love what you're doing here. Um, love that you're creating a space for folks to uh, talk about important things uh, Mm -hmm. in both arts and music and coffee. And like, these are uh, while they might feel like kind of insignificant conversations and funny memories, like these are real things that Mm -hmm. are, that, that talk about real people and, and, and real issues. So uh, it's a cool space you've created and I'm excited to see where it goes. I appreciate it. And same to you, like coffee director, like super envious. I love that you guys have just launched the roasting program at night swim. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to see yeah. how that grows. Uh, the our retail website website will should be going live at the end of this week. Um, so nightswimcoffee.com. Um, go buy some coffee. Write me a little note in it, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we'll we'll hook we'll hook some people up. Yeah, like XOXO at the end. XOXO, like, Evan. Hugs and kisses. Um, yeah, little hug, little hug, big keys, big keys, <laughs> little keys. Good toast. Um, <laughs> By the time that this episode comes out, the the website will be live. So um, everybody go check it out and give Evan some love. Yes, our. We'll take care. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thanks, Grayson, dude. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beans and Breakdowns. I want to say a huge thanks to Evan for coming on the podcast. I had such a great time getting to catch up with him. Uh, It's been so long, so it was just such a delight to hear all about his journey in coffee and what he's got going on over at Night Swim. 
be sure to go check out Night Swim's new website. Uh, it's nightswimcoffee.com. Pick up a bag of coffee. And if you're in the Charlotte area, visit one of their brick and mortar shops. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. You can find out more information about Beans and Breakdowns by following us on Instagram at Beans and Breakdowns and on the web at beansandbreakdowns.com. Until next week, be sure to stay caffeinated and wake the fuck up.